And now close up, we'll talk about the debt deal in Washington. Senator Kelly Ayotte is here to explain why she voted against this package. Also, fresh off a visit with potential presidential candidate Rick Perry, former RNC committee member Sean Mahoney talks about their meeting in Texas. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Josh McKelvin, and welcome to our new set here on Close Up, now in HD. Our first guest this morning, though, is the only member of the New Hampshire delegation to vote against last week's debt compromise in Washington. Senator Kelly Ayotte, welcome to the program. It's good to see you. Hey, thanks, Josh. It's good to be on your new set. Let's get right to it. Yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> Let's get right to it. Uh, you know, as the clock was ticking, the deadline was nearing. We were hearing from your office. You were looking at this package very closely. Ultimately, you decided, I cannot go along with this. Why? Well, essentially, we, I was really concerned that we didn't deal with the underlying problems that have led us to where we are today with a $14 trillion debt. And if you look at this package, you know, only in Washington with a slowing the rate of growth of the increase be called a cut because where this does is the first year it cuts seven billion dollars you know we spend about four four and a half billion dollars a day so that gets us uh, and borrow excuse me four and a half billion dollars a day that gets us to about thirty six hours of running our government and then what this agreement does is over the next ten years in discretionary spending it adds another eight hundred and thirty billion dollars of discretionary spending and nearly a trillion dollars a year to our already $14 trillion at over the next decade. So the concern that I had is that we didn't deal with the underlying issue, our debt. We addressed def default, which was very important, but we are headed for a downgrade of our credit rating under this agreement. Now, a, a lot of the members who did vote for the package weren't satisfied with the fact they didn't have the spending cuts, but they still voted for it. Let me ask you this. Say it came down to a, a tie-breaking vote. You were the tie-breaker, uh, and we're looking at default. You still voting against it? Well, Josh, I actually think that's a false choice because I think if there were more senators on both sides of the aisle that were willing to stand up and say, not only do we have to avoid default here, which I think we were in agreement on, but we have to come up with a solution to make sure that we don't have another year and then default, have another year and then downgrade our credit because if our credit gets downgraded, it is going to cost everyone, including our business owners, more to borrow money. It's going to hurt our economy and we're not dealing with the underlying problem and unfortunately I think it's just only in Washington would you congratulate yourself for not really cutting spending but only reducing the rate of growth and that's that's why I made this choice but most believe if, if not for coming up with this, this debt ceiling deal the credit would have been Moody's you know has kept our triple-a rating and most believe that if we hadn't come up with a deal it would have well, been taken away know, what Moody's and S&P have said is they said if you if we did not come up with a minimum of four trillion dollars in debt reduction over the next 10 years. That was the minimum we needed to do to stabilize our debt, that we are still looking at downgrading of our credit. So that was my concern. I think we could have done both. I know we're better than this. We could have avoided default and also avoided a deal that's going to lead us to a downgrade and doesn't deal with the underlying problems we have because I think unfortunately we've continued to kick this problem down the road and I just couldn't support that. You know, I've got two children and we have to deal with this crisis right now, not only for you and I, but for where we're putting the next generation and what the debt that we're burdening them with. Surprised or disappointed that you're the only member of the New Hampshire delegation that did vote against this package? I uh, know. I think that uh, every member of the delegation has to look at every vote themselves and assess it on its merit. I did not take this decision lightly. I looked at this very, very closely. But when I looked at the numbers, to only cut $7 billion between this year and 2012, and again, uh, that, that's just insufficient. And then to keep adding nearly a trillion dollars to our debt over the next decade, to me that was just not addressing what, what I ran on and what I know people in this country expect us to do. We can do better in Washington. So what happened down there? I mean, I, I can tell you from a standpoint, a lot of people, a lot of voters that I've spoken with, not talking about individual parties here, uh, there was a feeling of disgust basically right. with what they saw unfolding in right. Washington. What happened? Was there a central area of cuts that no one could come to a consensus on? Or was it just about getting a short-term deal done and let's also include this in the presidential debate in 2012? That was another, you know, cynical yeah, position people thought. I, I think, you know, I can understand why people in New Hampshire and across this country are frustrated uh, by Congress because, you know, they use common sense principles. Uh, they balance their budgets at home. Uh, they, when, they cut back when they don't have as much money coming in and in Washington you know only in Washington would the notion of balancing your budget be called a radical idea so what I think they see is that they want their members of Congress to use common sense and people were just 
putting out their political talking points without coming up with common sense solutions. So I understand why people are frustrated and they're sick of business as usual in Washington. And we need to change course. We need to preserve our country. Realistically, what could have been included in this package to really drastically reduce spending, in your opinion? In my opinion, yeah. um, real cuts, particularly in the first two years, because one of the things that happens in Washington is a lot of these cuts are in the, in the $917 billion in reductions mm -hmm. are actually in the out years. Yeah, we'll have new Congress, but we'll have new Congress in and they can they can change the law and not have to follow through with so I would have liked to seen us do uh, to make significant change budget reforms that's why I supported the cut cap and balance plan uh, but also a minimum of four trillion dollars in debt reduction over the next decade this plan even if everything goes well with this super committee and let's face it we don't have a great history in Congress of actually following through with these committees uh, then it's only amounts to a maximum of two point four trillion dollars in debt reduction. So we're not even doing the minimum we have to do to stabilize our debt. So dealing with those underlying problems like entitlement reform, Medicare goes bankrupt in 2024, Social Security in 2036, and we aren't fundamentally addressing these programs to preserve them for future generations. But where should the super committee look first, in your opinion? I mean, uh, if uh, these credit agencies want... I can want... tell you where the super committee Please. can look first. Uh, first of all, the GAO issued a report in March and came up, identified hundreds of duplicative programs where we could save billions and billions of dollars. My colleague, Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, has come up with a plan plan that proposes $9 trillion in debt reduction over the next 10 years. There's plenty you can like or not like in that program, but one of the things, examples he, you want one of the things he does is he identifies many duplicative programs um, within multiple departments, for example, job training programs where there are many different agencies doing the same things and there's no measurable outcome of results. Um, same thing in the Department of Education, other departments. So there are blueprints out there for, let's start with with the duplicative programs in Washington. The waste, but there's the, also going to be some waste. tough choices Absolutely. to get to where we tough need to go. tough choices too, and I, I think that's where we have to address entitlement programs. And let me just say, you know, I think it brings me back to the old uh, Ronald Reagan saying, there's nothing closer to eternal life than a government program. And I think that's why it's so hard this plan doesn't cut one program at this point. I'm hoping that this committee really does its work and more than they've been charged with, but we don't have a great history of that in Washington. All right, let's change the subject a little bit. It's funny you bring up Ronald Reagan because we're hearing just about every candidate in the presidential field now invoke him in one capacity or another. Yeah. Where, uh, where do you stand in the presidential race right now? Do you have, have you given any thought to? Well, Josh, anything? I've been speaking to the candidates and uh, I'm very interested in their views, particularly on the issues that you and I just talked about. Uh, what are their plans to make sure that we can preserve these entitlement programs that we can really get our fiscal house in order in Washington and what are they going to do in terms of allowing our economy to grow creating a positive climate for our businesses to thrive because those recent manufacturing numbers uh, it's very unfortunate where our national unemployment rate is and we need pro-growth policies that cut through the regulations in Washington and I also believe we need tax reform so that those are the types of questions that I'm asking the candidates. You know, the stock market fluctuated on Friday and bad day on Thursday certainly but Absolutely. you brought up the unemployment, uh, unemployment report which the president pointed to on Friday saying look our policies are working it's slow there's a headwind as far as the economy but we added jobs for the eight straight month and the unemployment rate uh, dropped by tenth of percent. Uh, the national unemployment rate is completely unacceptable we've seen stagnant growth and and we need, in order to improve where we are, we need to get people to work. We need to create a positive climate for our businesses. And I can tell you, I, I talk to so many business people in our state that tell me that the regulations that come down from Washington, Obamacare, the health care plan, things that we have that have been done in Washington are making it harder to create new jobs. And I also believe that we should have tax reform, make our tax code more competitive. We have the second highest corporate tax rate in the world, and we should be encouraging corporations to locate and grow here. Yeah, I want to end on this. Again, and it's a little bit redundant from what I said earlier, but a lot of voters are very skeptical about right. things getting done in Washington. Now, right. perfect example of that is the FAA fight, getting that funded That's deal was right. put in place on Friday. But they were $15 million. While, meanwhile, you had 42 residents in, in Nashua who yeah, were furloughed I mean, for two years. I don't think we should have gone home without resolving that. I mean, I think that's one of the problems in Washington is uh, that people aren't finding real solutions. And I understand why people are frustrated. You know, I ran 
to get our fiscal house in order. I want real solutions, and I'm going to continue to work to make sure we identify wasteful spending. Uh, for example, I just came out asking the Defense Department to eliminate nearly $800 million on, on a defense program, mm -hmm. which is a weapons program that's never going to le lead to something that our troops can use in the battlefield. These are the kinds of things we have to get done, and we need to change what is happening in the course of our country. And people out there know it because at home they balance their budgets, and that's what we need to do in Washington. Just, uh, eight months, seven months away from the primary, you hope anybody else jumps in? Well, you know, as you know, New Hampshire, we welcome more candidates. Uh, so if somebody else wants to jump, jump in, have them jump in. And I want to see them out campaigning in New Hampshire and doing all the grassroots events and answering the tough questions from New Hampshire folks and constituents. All right. Well, Senator, it's great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. I know Thank it's been you. a long month in Washington. Yeah, well, thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. No problem at all. We're going to be right back with Sean Mahoney, by the way, who is among the delegation meeting with Texas